All right. So welcome, uh, welcome everyone. It is wonderful uh, to have everyone here today for uh, this uh, bar mitzvah of Miller. <laughs> <Hillary> Miller. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we're we're very excited to see such a, a lovely audience here, both uh, in person and uh, on on the Zoom. Um, so uh, uh, it's going to be a very rich program. We're very excited to honor our colleague, Professor Stuart Miller. You're going to hear many wonderful things uh, said about Professor Stuart Miller, who uh, is, can I call you one of the founding fathers <laughs> of uh, Judaic studies at, at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he has been here. I'm saying, I'm speaking in the present tense, by the way. He has been here uh, for over 40 years, uh, starting in 1982, and has really been the architect of our program in Hebrew and Judaic Studies at the University of Connecticut, uh, designing our uh, major, our minor in Hebrew and Judaic Studies, our master's program, our PhD program. You're going to hear so much more about his contributions to uh, the University of Connecticut. And of course, also to uh, his scholarly field in ancient Judaism. And we have a, uh, hopefully everybody was able to uh, grab a copy of our program, uh, which is a very rich program with some uh, extremely distinguished speakers. We're all here to honor uh, Professor Miller. Um, so I'm not going to go on for too long because we have such a, a complete program, but uh, I'm very excited to serve as the MC. By the way, for those who don't know, know me, my name is Abhinav Noam Pat. I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies here at University of Connecticut and the Doris and Simon Conover Chair of, of Judaic Studies. So uh, at first, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce, to welcome uh, Professor Susan Herbst, uh, University Professor of Political Science and President Emeritus of the University of Connecticut. Uh, Professor Herbst is a distinguished scholar of American history and political science. Uh, and uh, fascism in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, and was also a key contributor to our uh, Why the Jews Confronting Anti-Semitism course that we designed here that uh, Stuart Miller also was one of the designers of the class. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Susan Herbst to uh, offer some words of welcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Bob. Let me make sure I don't trip over any sandbags. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks, Avi. So when Avi was planning this event um, and offered me the opportunity to say a few words, I jumped at it and I'm really, I'm honored. Um, as president of the university, you get to know the work and the reputation of the premier faculty, and that's part of the job. Um, but there are some people who stand out as scholars, as teachers, as pillars of the community, people who loved and built the, the university long before you got there. And Stuart is one of those folks uh, dedicated to our institution and our students. He's kind, he's rigorous, and his thinking is full of ideas, as, as all of you know. Uh, when you're the president, you have good days and bad days, um, heavy on the bad days. Uh, so when I saw Stuart's name in my inbox when I was president uh, with ideas or suggestions or critique, I was always glad to open it um, because I knew that it would be supportive in the end and that he was trying to help. There are a handful of faculty, that's like one hand, maybe, <laughs> who don't demand anything, um, and they just want to help further the institution. Uh, they see through a lot of the nonsense, and they know precisely what our jobs are as educators. And for all that, I can't thank Stuart enough, because he is in that rarefied group. Um, a lot of people today are going to talk about a scholarship, uh, so I'll leave that to them, and I'm here to, here to learn. Although I think of Stuart as the um, Philip Roth whisperer, because uh, that, that's, that's his work I know the best, but I look forward to hearing about all of it. Um, I know that we have some of students, uh, Stuart's students here, but um, most of our students drift away and we don't hear from them again. It's just an aspect of being a professor that we accept. Um, we rarely get a sense of how we shape students um, into the future. But reading through some of the reviews of Stuart's teaching, which I did, I know he's had a huge impact. Uh, these days, we're supposed to use all kinds of bells and whistles and newfangled technologies to keep our students engaged. Uh, but Stuart is the kind of great, difficult, caring teacher who should be, to my mind, the university model, regardless of discipline. 
no fancy technology needed. Maybe you did start with fancy technology, but um, I couldn't tell that from the student. Yeah, the students. Um, but to take this class, uh, you'll be a better adult, ready to learn, take your education seriously. So a few of the typical comments, quote, a captivating speaker with a humorous, cynical edge, and one of those rare people who truly thinks, all caps, about every aspect of his subject. Lots of reading, music to my ears. Um, all Jews and anyone interested in Judaism should take this class, unquote. Um, another quote, this was one of the most enlightening classes I've taken. Dr. Miller not only teaches about the history and philosophy of Judaism, but also trains his students in critical thinking that is invaluable in every, all caps, field of study. Listen in class, do the readings, and you will do great and enjoy it. But my favorite comment simply, quote, I have never loved a professor more. Well, what's better than that? Uh, thank you, Stuart, for building this university, for inspiring our students and your colleagues. Um, and thanks for holding true to the highest values of scholarship in so many ways. Thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, sorry, I'm just going to let in the Zoom verse. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I just want to mention, by the way, that um, it's a very rich program and we'll be here uh, for some time. So there are snacks in the back. Please feel free to help yourself as we go through the program. Um, uh, there will be intellectual nourishment, but there's a little uh, extra nourishment as well. And then we'll have a reception after the program. Um, so thank you so much, uh, President Herbst, for your, for your words of welcome and for emphasizing uh, how much Stuart has contributed mm -hmm. to building our scholarly community, our academic community, but also how much he has meant to our students here, generations of students, some of whom are here in the room, some of whom are joining us in the Zoom room. Um, uh, over the years at the University of Connecticut. Uh, Stuart has also been a very active member in uh, the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages uh, at the University of Connecticut, of which Hebrew and Judaic Studies is one of the 10 sections in, in our department. And so to offer greetings on behalf of uh, the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, it's a pleasure to welcome a close friend and colleague of Professor Miller's, uh, Sarah Johnson, welcome. Thank you. I mean, thanks everyone for being here. I tried to keep my remarks very short, um, even though there's so much more I can say about uh, Stuart. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else uh, has to share. It's hard for me to imagine LCL going forward without Stuart. Stuart chaired the search committee that brought me to UConn in 1998. When I arrived at UConn, Stuart had been part of what was then the Department of Modern and Classical Languages for 16 years and was among the seniors and mentors that to me represented the backbone of the department. This fall will mark my 25th anniversary with UConn. And I cannot say that I feel at all qualified to step into the role that my seniors are now passing to me with their retirement. I'm deeply grateful to Stuart for bringing me to UConn and even more grateful for the climate of the department that he and his peers fostered and have handed on to us. Collegial, good humored, humble, and profoundly dedicated to the ideal of professional service, service to students, to the university, and to the community along with the distinguished scholarship that has so often brought graduate students to UConn specifically to study with Stuart. And I know some of them are here today uh, in person or virtually, we'll hear from some of them. I'm excited for the opportunities that retirement will bring for Stuart, but mourn the professional loss of a colleague and friend whose specialty that dovetailed so closely with mine. I am comfortable in the Hellenistic world of the Seleucids and, Tom, and, and um, uh, Stu, Seleucids and Ptolemies, but Stuart has forgotten more about Josephus and Philo than I will ever know, to say nothing of his deep expertise in the field of archaeology and the world of the rabbis. He's occasionally paid me the compliment of coming to me with a question about Josephus's Greek, but my advice was rarely needed. 
I only wish that my Hebrew may one day be anywhere near as good as Stuart's Greek. Some of my fondest memories from my early years at Yukon are of digging at Sephiroth in the summer of, I think it was 2000, I read that year right. We had hoped that I would be able to join the excavation regularly in the years to come, but sadly, political developments meant that 2000 was the last season at Sephiroth for Yukon. Those circumstances, however, did not stop Stuart from continuing to make engagement with the material coming out of Sephiroth one of the hallmarks of his distinguished career in the scholarly literature. The archaeological experts among us today will be able to speak much more eloquently on that subject than I can. A new colleague, Yoni, will be just joining us in the fall. And I look forward to building a new relationship with my new colleague in the field of Judaism in antiquity. Although not formally part of the search committee, Stuart was very much part of the process at every step of the way, even in retirement. I very much hope that retirement will not put an end to frequent visits to Yukon and meetings at colloquia and conferences. May retirement also bring new and rich opportunities whether for scholarship or for enjoying a richly earned period of relaxation, travel, and time spent with family and friends. It is hard for me to grasp that um, from the mother of grandchildren was once a small girl who came with her father to help paint his office in Arjona. I look forward to seeing what the next 25 years will bring. Thank you so much, Professor Johnson. Uh, so uh, as, as we've heard, Stuart truly is a, a Renaissance man uh, whose uh, interests and expertise span millennia, right? From uh, the sages of, uh, of ancient uh, Israel, uh, uh, from the sages of Greco-Roman Palestine to the sages of Newark, uh, as he <laughs> embarks on this uh, new career, uh, learning more about Philip Roth. And the Jews of, of Newark. Um, and as he is part of our Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, there is a great deal of his work that also deals with uh, comparative literature uh, as well uh, in all uh, times and in all places. And uh, so it is it's my pleasure to welcome another of our colleagues from the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages and a core member of our program in Hebrew and Judaic Studies who was our interim director of the Center for Judaic Studies for several years and has been a close confidant in uh, the development of our program and has worked closely with Stuart for, for many years. So it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Sebastian Bogenstein to offer some words of welcome. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, <clears throat> distinguished guests, uh, dear Stuart, um, it's a tremendous honor to speak here at this illustrious celebration. And thank you, Avi, for inviting me. So where to start? I, I can't think of Tsipuri or Sepharis or Mikvah or Stepped Pool, the Shiva Brachot, and so many other things called Roth without having Stuart's words ring in my ears. But I'm sure others who are much better qualified will say more about all this scholarship. <clears throat> my task is to represent the department together here with Sarah Johnson, those colleagues uh, from the Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages uh, who are here this afternoon, and I see Sarah Johnson, Katharina von Hammerstein, Avi Pat, Miguel Gomez, uh, Manuel Wagner, uh, former colleague Dan Kainer, new colleague Yoni Miller, and then via Hedges Association, Arnie Deshevsky, Fred Roden, and Sarah Will. Um, <clears throat> everyone will confirm that Stuart has been, without any doubt, one of the most respected and appreciated members in the department. I think the fact that he had been elected um, to the most important departmental committee, the Promotion Tenure and Reappointment Committee from time immemorial, at least from my vantage point, uh, continuously to his retirement speaks for itself. Um, but what made him so popular in the department? Let me take a little detour to explain. So <clears throat> stores, is about 45 minutes uh, from West Hartford or 50, depending which way you go. And there are two ways to get there. One is Interstate 84, which ways and I think are faster or is faster. And then there's the other way that uh, Stuart and my wife, Sarah Willen uh, prefer, Interstate 384. 
and then which is 384 and then a long stretch of route 44 through the woods and whenever we go that way I never fail to think of Stuart who told me more than once that it's the scenic route um, especially with the beautiful colorful foliage in the fall I think there's a case to be made um, that beauty and enjoyment aren't just things that we may add if we can afford it in our hectic times, uh, but these are things that matter and that make us human. And for Stuart, I think one of the things with which he brings beauty into the lives of others is not only his writing, but also his music. And I, I, I don't think he ever brought his guitar to campus but I simply can't imagine Stuart without his signature guitar ties. <laughs> and as I would consider his guitar tie, not just a fashion statement, but almost a kind of attribute, I can't think of Stuart without appreciating his thoughtfulness, his reliability and kindness uh, towards everyone in the department, towards colleagues, staff, and students. And so I think, you know, this is the not so secret secret to his popularity. My wife, uh, Sarah Willen, and my kids, Hadassah and Nadine, who are somewhere downstairs, um, have always felt so welcomed here in the community. And Stuart and his wife, Laura, were among the first to invite us into their home and their sukkah soon after we moved here. It's so wonderful to have you as neighbors, literally just around two corners. And neighbors through pleasant times and then through some rough times, when we experience power outages and pandemic, the lockdowns we all saw last would last you know a few weeks. So I have to say that Laura, um, who should also be celebrated today, is not just the kindest but also the wisest person. One example, and I sure I'll, I'll be done very soon. Not so long ago, when I was talking with Stuart and Laura on the on their porch, I mentioned that my in-laws were coming in from Cleveland or just arrived, and so Laura immediately cut off our conversation and said. I shouldn't waste time with academic talk and instead take Sarah out for dinner while we had our natural babysitters. That wasn't the suggestion, <laughs> that was an instruction. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, back to the department business. While we miss you, uh, Stuart, in your various functions as academic director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life, as section chair of the Hebrew and Judaic Studies section, and as one of the most senior colleagues who was entrusted with all sorts of administrative tasks and committee work, I take comfort in assuming that you won't shed too many tears about not having to deal with these administrative tasks anymore, and will now have more time to, uh, to, to uh, focus on the things that really matter. Uh, and I'm excited that we can now welcome a new Miller to the department. As they say about uh, Moses from the Torah and Moses from Maimonides, mi Moshe ad Moshe, lokam to Moshe, mi Miller ad Miller, lokam to Miller. The Miller to Miller, there was none like Miller. So as we celebrate this milestone of going from one chapter in your life, Stuart, to the next one, I will conclude by saying, as we do when we finish one book of the Torah and transition to the next, chazak, chazak, renit chazek. Be strong, be strong, and we will get stronger together. Many congratulations on your retirement, Stuart. Mazal tov to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. And uh, I think I think we're getting a sense for uh, the very dynamic nature of Stewart's contributions to to our community, uh, to the University of Connecticut. I, I have to say, it's wonderful to see so many people here with us in the room today. So much uh, support from not only our our Yukon community, but from our community here in in our hometown. So and globally as well. It's really a tribute to. Uh, the esteem to which your your work and your contributions are held, Stuart and Sebastian. I'm so happy you, you mentioned as well, Laura, uh, uh, the sort of pillars of of the community and and of the work. And uh, I know from so many conversations uh, with Stuart about sort of the best course of action uh, for the Center for Judaic Studies, but also the academic direction of the center. Some of the best advice that we have received has actually come via Laura. So uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm glad you also mentioned the classical guitar playing as well, because uh, some of you may have seen, we shared with the announcement of um, you know, this program today, 
that there was a lovely uh, feature article in the Connecticut Jewish Ledger, or now Southern New England Jewish Ledger, uh, that talked about uh, Stewart's roles and his contributions to Yukon over the course of 40 years. And one of the things that Stewart noted upon his retirement that he was so happy to be able to do was to devote more time to his classical guitar playing and in fact, uh, take advantage of a residency at Music Mountain last year and playing with a classical quartet. So um, I don't think we're gonna have a concert today, but uh, uh, maybe maybe next time, sort of a, a future uh, program that we might have. Um, so today's program, in addition to uh, being uh, tributes uh, to Stuart, we really thought that the best way to honor uh, Stuart and to honor uh, Stuart's work and his scholarship and his phenomenal contributions to the field uh, was to uh, have a scholarly symposium. Um, so we are indeed going to have a scholarly symposium with a number of presentations by very distinguished scholars in the field of uh, Judaic studies and specifically of ancient Judaism who are going to speak to going to speak to Stuart's contributions to the study of uh, ancient Judaism. So you'll see on, on our program, we have some very distinguished uh, speakers who are joining us both uh, in person and uh, via, via the Zoom. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, going to share. Okay, there you can see it. Um, our first uh, presentation. Um, sorry, this is the challenge of trying to do everything simultaneously. One second. Um, let me just go into slideshow. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I it will appear in a second. There we go. Okay, so um, our our first speaker in our uh, scholarly symposium section of our program today is uh, Professor Lawrence Schiffman, um, who, uh, if I am not mistaken, and we might hear more about this. Uh, Stuart was Larry's first PhD student at NYU. Uh, so it's really a, a great honor to have Professor Schiffman here with us today to uh, speak to Stuart's contributions to the study of ancient Judaism. Lawrence Schiffman is the Judge Abraham Lieberman uh, Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University and Director of the Global Network for Advanced Research in Jewish Studies. He has served as the chair of the Sturbell yeah. Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at NYU, and also the Ur Ethel and Irvin Edelman Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies. Between 2011 and 2014, he served as vice provost for undergraduate education and professor of Judaic Studies at Yeshiva University. He's a very, very distinguished scholar um, uh, with uh, numerous uh, degrees and numerous honors and numerous visiting uh, professorships. He has uh, had multiple publications, including Who Was a Jew? Rabbinic Perspective on the Jewish Christian Schism, From Text to Tradition, A History of Second Temple and Rabbinic Judaism, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, The Courtyards of the House of the Lord, Studies on the Temple Scroll, Qumran and Judaism, uh, Jerusalem, Studies in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the History of Judaism, and, and on. Uh, but I think you get a sense uh, for what an honor it is for us to have Professor Schiffman here with us. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here, and I want to begin by thanking the organizers for putting this wonderful program together. Of course, we should stack Sam Stewart if he hadn't retired, he wouldn't be here. <laughs> so let me begin also by saying that in some way you can understand that in a certain way, this is a strange experience for me. There we go. <laughs> Today I am speaking in honor of the first student whose doctoral dissertation I supervised, who is retiring while I'm still teaching. <laughs> in 1972, when I arrived at NYU, I met Stewart, then an undergraduate pursuing Judaic studies in the context of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Literature a department that included not only Hebrew Judaic studies to the extent that it fit into Near Eastern context, but also Arabic and Islamic studies. 
Stewart was one of the few advanced Judaic study students who worked with our late teacher and renowned, the renowned Bible scholar, Professor Baruch Levine, who, by the way, taught me at Brandeis before he came to NYU. And also the late Professor Frank Peters, right, who uh, was a historian with strong interest in the Greco-Roman Near East. And you will notice on the right side, that is the copy of Stewart's first book that he uh, endorsed over to Frank Peters. And if you want, you can buy that for $33, this copy on eBay. <laughs> Okay, at any rate, uh, okay. So um, then Stewart immediately began studying with me and then continued his graduate work at NYU, received his PhD and wrote the dissertation that would eventually be revised into his uh, first book, which we will be coming back in, in a few minutes. As a result, I should publicly thank Stu for starting off my career as a doctoral advisor. Since, as we all know, we learn more from our students than we teach them. And this is only a small, small part of what I owe to him. Stuart embarked on a dissertation regarding the history and historical traditions of Sepphoris, Hebrew Tzipori, a major city in the land of Israel in the Greco-Roman period, home of Rabbi Judah the Prince, the editor of the Mishnah. This decision would shape much of the early years of his career. Before I tell you about the importance of the book that emerged from this research, I need to fill you in on the difficult context in which Stuart was working. At this time, Jacob Neusner was on the one hand bringing the study of Judaism in late antiquity into the university classroom, but on the other hand was terrorizing scholars who approached historical value of rabbinic materials in a way different from his. In order to launch his eventual career, Stewart had to find a way to navigate the difficult task of using those very materials for historical purposes without raising the ire of this senior professor. The fact that Neusner eventually published this volume in a series he edited showed Stewart's success in dealing with the challenge. It is interesting that later on in his career, as we will mention, Stewart again faced and dealt with a similar challenge. It's very dark over here, I must say. Okay. Um, the dissertation was easily turned into Stewart's first book entitled Studies of the History and Traditions of Sepphoris that appeared in 1984. At the start, after detailing what was already known historically and archaeologically about Sepphoris, he dealt with the difficulty of establishing a method for using rabbinic literature for historical research. The largest part of the book consists of two studies. The first deals with rabbinic references to the old castra, Latin for camp, the word castra, the castra and the old arche or archive of Sepphoris. He concludes that the old castra referred to the earliest Jewish settlement in the city. In pre-revolt Sepphoris, the castra per se refers to the Roman soldiers mentioned that were stationed there, and the arche refers to the municipal archives that also dated to before the Great Revolt. He then discussed the priesthood in Sepphoris. Here he argued that there was no evidence for a concentrated settlement of priests in the city before the third century CE. This argument counters the view that Sepphoris was a priestly center already before 70, or became one in the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132 to 5. This work established Stuart as a historian who could work with rabbinic and Greco-Roman historical sources in excruciating detail in order to establish conclusions that could not be refuted. This would be a pattern of his research throughout. Ah, well, I'm telling you, it's too small. No, there's no light here. I guess there is no. The city of Sepphoris remained a major concern of his, as can be seen by a series of scholarly articles related to this city published between 1987 and 2004. And there are two articles in some of these years. However, during this period, Stewart made a major decision to join the archaeological excavations at Sepphoris, as uh, the leaders of the excavation were eager for his historical expertise. Further, this established its close relationship with Eric Myers of Duke University, whom I understand we will hear from, America's leading archaeologist of the land of Israel in the Greco-Roman period. Participation in these excavations, along with a group of students from uh, Yukon, 
gave Stuart not only archaeological experience and firsthand knowledge, but clearly widened his perspectives regarding the Galilee as a whole. Further, throughout these excavations, he established relationships with a variety of American and Israeli colleagues. This also gave him the opportunity to publish his research in the excavation report. Beginning already in 1999, his work began to shift from its concentration on Sepphoris to the Greater Galilee. It was in this period that his interest in mikvah, oh, Jewish ritual baths, took a hold and would eventually become a major area of his research. Ah, wrong order, sorry. This widening perspective led to his second book, ah, there we go. Sages and Commoners in Late Antique Eretz Israel, a philological inquiry into local traditions in Talmud Yushami, published in 2006. This book clearly showed him to be an expert in rabbinic literature without any question. The amount of texts and traditions that he analyzed was unparalleled. In this work, he addressed a number of issues in the history of Talmudic Palestine that are at the center of contemporary scholarly discussion. And specifically, a debate, debate about the role that the rabbis played in society. In sharp contrast to recent claims that are almost becoming normative to the effect that the rabbis were a relatively small and insular group with little influence on society as a whole, this book demonstrated that their movement was both more expansive and diffuse than a mere counting of named rabbis suggests. It also underscores some of the dynamics that allowed rabbinic circles to spread their teachings and to ultimately consolidate into an effective and productive movement. Many overlook terms and passages in which rabbis and members of their circles appear in the Talmud Yushalmi are investigated in detail and special attention is given to the identity of persons who are collectively referred to after their geographic places of, re of residence like Tiberians, Sepharians, Southerners, etc. Notice, by the way, that he still didn't give up on Sephiroth. Subjects that are considered include rabbinic households, the identity of the Ame Haaretz and their relation to the rabbis, village sages, and their connection to urban rabbis, and the venue of rabbinic teachings, instructions, expositions, pronouncements, and stories. Our colleague and friend Stephen Fine, in reviewing this book, stated, and we'll be hearing from him soon, Stuart Miller is the premier historian of Palestinian rabbinic culture in North America today. Through a series of works and continuing in the present volume, Miller is focused like a laser beam upon the complex relationship between text, history, and the social history of the ancient rabbis, with broad implications for contemporary scholarship. That's the end of the quotation. We need to linger a moment on the broad implications. In the introduction to this volume, Stewart essentially attacked those who argued for the minimal significance of the rabbi in what modern scholars call rabbinic Judaism in the land of Israel in late antiquity. Professor Fine correctly argued in his own work that these minimalist approaches are informed more by modern anti-rabbinicism, if there is such a word, as by the reality of the ancient world. In a certain way, Stewart's entire book is not simply a polemic against his view, but disproof of it. What I want to emphasize is that here again, just as Stewart had to engage with the minimalism of Jacob Neusner at the beginning of his career, he again returned to, in this volume to engaging with the more recent minimalism, and once again, as he did, succeeded in making his point. This is the case even if his opponents will never be convinced. Stewart's articles published between 2007 and 2010 point toward his next book and to the continuation of his interest in issues pertaining to mikvah oh. Clearly, in these years, most of his effort was focused on his next book at the intersection of texts and material finds, step pools, stone vessels, and ritual purity in Roman Palestine, published in 2014. This third book led to his election to the prestigious American Academy for Jewish Research. Here he examined the hermeneutical challenges posed by the material and literary evidence pertaining to ritual purity practices in Greco-Roman Palestine, and especially in the Galilee. Actually, this monograph is a sweeping rethinking of how ritual purity rites, especially ritual immersion, are studied, and how archeological finds are to be understood in light of literary evidence and vice versa. Attention is also given to the perspectives on ritual purity and immersion in early Christianity, especially as reflected in a Greek fragment from the Atsirikis papyri, 
which depicts a debate on the subject between Jesus and the high priest on the Temple Mount. Stewart contends that Step Pool generally termed with the later term Mikvo, which we now know were in, were, were in use well beyond the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem, and as indicated by the large collection on the Western metropolis, Sepphoris and elsewhere, into the middle and late Roman Byzantine periods, must be understood in light of biblical and popular perspectives on ritual purity. Stewart argues that the interpretation of the farms is too frequently forced to conform to rabbinic prescriptions when oftentimes, when oftentimes these details were the result of the sages' unique and creative minimum, a max nominalist approach to ritual purity. In this volume, he gives special attention to the role ritual purity continued to play in the lives of ordinary Jews, despite or because of the loss of the temple. He argues against the prevailing tendency to tight material fonts and Jewish society, according to known groups from pre-70 periods, such as Pharisaic, Sadducean, Essenic, post-CE, rabbinic, priestly, etc. He further counters the perception that ritual purity practices were largely the interests of priests and argues against the recent suggestion that the priests resurfaced as an influential group in late uh, antiquity, a view that has gained popularity among scholars despite the complete lack of evidence. Building upon his earlier work on sages and commoners, he takes the view that the rabbis emerged out of a context in which biblically derived complex common Judaism thrived. Step pools, stone vessels, and other material finds are seen by him as belonging to the complex common Judaism. He argues that a crucial reading of the rabbis indicates, careful reading of the rabbis, that they were acutely aware of the extent to which ritual purity pertaining to home and family life had spread, which undoubtedly contributed to their intense interest in regulating these uh, aspects of life. Surprising for many, this volume actually includes a section at the very back pertaining to a mikvah in Chesterfield, Connecticut. In 2012, Professor Miller, along with then state archeologist, Nicholas Bellantoni, co-directed the Yukon-sponsored excavation of a ritual bath that once belonged to New England Hebrew farmers of the Emanuel Society, a Jewish agricultural community that was founded in the early 1890s in Chesterfield, Connecticut. My wife Marlene and I spent the day with Stu and some of his colleagues visiting the excavation, as well as the remnants of the synagogue there and several early farming town synagogues in the area. This modern project is not only not his only one, as he has recently published a rejoinder to some incorrect historical claims regarding the Jewish community of Newark, where he grew up. At the beginning of this talk, I expressed my thanks to Stuart for having started me off as a doctoral advisor. Now I conclude by expressing thanks to him for an accomplishment of his uh, and some other members of uh, my former student group towards the end of my career. He led a group of other former students, now our academic colleagues, in assembling a volume in my honor, including articles by 20 former students. And for this, I am forget forever grateful. I have tried here to give a sense of the contributions that Stuart has made to the study of Jews and Judaism in late antiquity. We all know as well, and we've heard about it today, of his many contributions to the building of Judaic studies here at UConn. We can only hope that as he retires from the university, he will continue to produce important scholarship for years to come, and that we will continue to benefit from his collegiality and friendship. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't unplug your computer. No, okay. Oh, I did. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Schiffman. Um, sorry. Uh, let more people in from the Zoom room. Oh, wait. All right, sorry. 
Uh, this is always the challenge of doing the multiple things at the same time. Uh, one second. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Okay, so our can you know, just make sure we get the I want to make sure this is sharing via the doing. That. Okay, so while we're while we're doing that, um, yeah. Um, so it's it's not sharing on that Zoom for some reason. Um, so while we're doing that, I'll, I'll introduce our next speaker. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Professor Chipman. Sorry, this is the, the challenge of trying to do the hybrid uh, event, which is uh, always uh, the most complicated part of this. Um, someday, scholars of the future, Stuart, will uh, write about uh, ritual purity and Zoom. I don't know. Um, okay, it looks like looks like we're we're getting it together. So um, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Chipman. Um, uh, as uh, as uh, you suggested, um, Stuart has made so many contributions uh, to our field, and I've been able to see uh, his development over his entire uh, academic career. And um, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to uh, welcome a number of speakers who can speak to his multiple contributions to to multiple uh, fields. And so our next speaker, who I'm uh, honored to uh, to introduce. Is Professor Stephen Fine. Uh, Professor Stephen Fine is the Dean Pinchas Jurgen? Jurgen. Pinchas with a chet. Okay. Uh, Dean Pinchas Jurgen, Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University. Uh, he's a historian of Judaism in the Greco Roman world uh, and director of the Arch of Titus Digital Restoration Project and of the Yeshiva University Center for Israel Studies and a founding editor of. Images, a journal of Jewish art and visual culture. As a cultural historian, Fine's research focuses on relationships between the literature of ancient Judaism, art, and archaeology. This blend of history, rabbinic literature, archaeology, and art, together with deep engagement with historiography and contemporary culture, is expressed in a broad range of publications. Among his uh, many publications, for which he has received numerous awards, or the, this holy place on the sanctity of the synagogue during the Greco-Roman period, published in 1997. Art in Judaism in the Greco-Roman world toward a new Jewish archaeology, uh, published in 2005 and in the second edition in 2010, uh, which was recipient of the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award by the Association for Jewish Studies. Sacred Realm, the emergence of the synagogue in the ancient world, uh, and many, many more. I think most recently, uh, the menorah uh, from the Bible to modern Israel published in 2016. And as you uh, just heard, he was also one of the co-editors uh, together with Stuart Miller, Michael Swartz, uh, and Naomi Grunhaus and Alex Jassen uh, from Scrolls to Traditions, the Fetrick honoring Professor Lawrence Schiffman. So it is uh, a pleasure for me to welcome Professor Stephen Fong. Hi, everyone. Hello, Stuart. Um, I was a student in Jerusalem, and I had a teacher who had a profound influence on, on Stuart and on me named Lauren Schiffman, who had a particular penchant for making sure that his students were friends, one after the next, generation after generation. And so I was the one with the house in Nachlaot, and as each student came through Jerusalem, we somehow found each other, usually in my living room, um, which I just point out, that's an amazing thing that eventually became a Feshra. 
<laughs> without a discouraging word. Can you speak closer to the mic? I can. Why well, can you speak up too? Now, in those days, Stuart was on sabbatical and he brought this little tiny girl named Viva to our house. Um, and the little girl, I know that years later, Aviva would be my student in my seminar at the Bernard Rebel Graduate School. And this is the relationship that is so intertwined. And why is that? It's because Stuart's generosity and bigness took a little graduate student as a peer. And so we went off to dig with Eric Myers at Sepphoris and continued a relationship that, as my title says, was, was complexly interesting. Why? Because if you've read Stewart's books, every footnote could be an article. If you read my stuff, the footnotes are okay, but the articles say exactly what I meant. Now, what the greatness of Stewart's work is that it brings together such variety and such depth on very specific subjects that then we find out affect the entire field. And that's really the greatness of the project. And so what I'd like to do is share with you some of what I've been working on in conversation uh, with Stuart. I remember a number of years ago, 2000, we were living in Cincinnati and I got an email that said, furious in Hartford. <laughs> And he, I spoke to him and said, what are you furious about? Well, I read this book. Haven't you read it? And I wrote back to him and I said, no, but I went and read it. I went to the Hebrew College Library and read it. And I wrote back and said, smoking in Cincinnati. <laughs> now, the truth is that there are two teams in American Jewish studies. Um, and they're usually friends and sometimes not. But they come start with fundamentally different instincts about how to read materials. And so what I want to do is share with you some of the complexities of, of those conversations and how we've dealt with them over a long period. And so this is in many ways a reflection on Stuart uh, on how many years? An awful lot of years. How old are you? An awful <laughs> lot of years of work together. Okay? Okay. How more do I change my song? Does it go like that? It's a basic necessity to change this place. Where do I do this next time? Bobby, do I do it from here? Okay. Now, here you see Stuart Miller. Now, Larry showed this picture um, on your left. Um, that's Stuart doing what every major scholar does, which is go to a Roman site and sit on the newly discovered bath on toilet. <laughs> Okay, so that's Stuart on the toilet at Sepphoris in the middle of Stuart teaching, and then Stuart in his mikvah. Now, all of these together are not what he thought he would be doing at the beginning of this career, except maybe the picture in the middle, because Stuart never imagined that he'd become involved with all this stuff, all this archaeology, but it became a necessity for this creative mind to delve into that material because it was obvious that the contiguous relationship between the archaeological material and the sources he was interested in required him to learn about archaeology. And so that process, which happily he brought lots and lots of University of Connecticut students along with for the ride. Let's see if it works this time. Now, this is the word Judaism. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, it goes on longer. I only gave you little parts. Now, why have I given it to you? Because if we're going to deal with complex Judaism and something, we have to know what Judaism is, and I'm not quite sure yet. After all, Judaism can be the religion of the Jews. It can be the culture of the Jews. It can be the Jews. In other words, it's one of those terms that is so elastic <laughs> from period to period until it hit American religious studies, where it became that thing next to Christianity. Now, that limited it, as we'll see. He's back. This is a native of uh, Hartford, Connecticut, Jacob Neusner. Now, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, uh, some people will remember that when Jews spoke of themselves, they never spoke about denominations. They talked about streams of Judaism because everyone was afraid to assert that they were separate religions. That changed 
in the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, when the more liberal denominations asserted their denominational status, and that found its way into the academic conversation with the assumption that each group has its own Judaism, as opposed to a shared Judaism that each group is a piece of. It had a lot to do with the sociology of the community, had to do with the sociology of, of Protestantism and Catholicism in America. Uh, and Jack Neusner was the major prophet of this notion. Every book is its own Judaism. Every person practically is its own Judaism. Now, let's try this. In the 19th century, there was reformed Judaism. You got the DD. Well, if you're going to have Reformed Judaism, you have, to have Orthodox Judaism. Then you need the Judaism in between. And then the, what about those people who have no religion? Well, they become secular Judaism, right? But then there's the academics who got into the business. Because so as not to use Orthodox Judaism, they used normative Judaism. Okay. Then apocalyptic Judaism for people who didn't look like they should be those rabbis who lived in buildings that looked like this one in New, in New England and had all those awful mystical things attached to them. Then there's diaspora Judaism, because, you know, Greek-speaking Jews have a higher level of culture than those Aramaic-speaking Jews from Palestine. And then there's Samaritan Judaism. Now, here's the problem, of course, that Samaritans don't come from Judea. So you cannot have Judeans be a part of a Judaism. But they didn't have any other words for dealing with this problem. And so within the Judaism, they actually snuck in a... a parallel religion that wasn't actually part of Judaism. So it's very strange, and that's the crux of our problem today. Now, another group, starting off in Oxford, were two scholars. What an American, Ed, Ed, Ed Sanders. The other one, Peter Brown. Ed Sanders, a scholar of New Testament. Peter Brown, a scholar who made up the word late antiquity. Now, both of them came to a conclusion that I think has a lot to do with the fact that they were working in an Anglican environment. In other words, that there is a shared religion across the bounds, even when you're different. And Ed referred to that as common Judaism. And isn't it funny that Peter responded to that with virtually the same word, Koine means common. So common Christianity. Now, in comes Stuart Miller. I thought common Judaism was just fine. I thought Jewish Koine was just great. No, Stuart wanted to make absolutely sure using complexity theory, I got that right, right? Using complexity theory that everyone would know that he knew that the religion he was talking about was complex. So they're common but complex on the scale. Now, you hear the, the great caution in language that is embedded in complex common Judaism, which doesn't include, I hope, these people, right? The Samaritans, who I spent a lot of time with lately with an exhibition and a movie and a book, but that's not the point. The Samaritans don't fit anybody's expectations, and they certainly are not part of complex common Judaism. And they certainly are not part of Samaritan Judaism. So what are these people? How do we categorize them? Now, first of all, who are these people? 850 something people on Mount Grisim, if someone didn't die today, more or less, right? It could be 852. 850 people spread between Cologne near Tel Aviv and Mount Grisim. 850 people who represent a third of the population of late antique Palestine who have been virtually ignored in modern scholarship in Jewish studies in America. <laughs> Why? Because there was a great interest in these descendants of the 10 tribes of Israel. These are the ones that aren't lost. Descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh and Levi. There was a great interest in them at the end of the 19th century. And it continued through World War II, the beginning of World War II. Then they found these scraps in the desert somewhere out there, right? in Qumran. <laughs> And all of the air was sucked up by Dead Sea Scrolls, and Samaritans were virtually forgotten, except by a very small group of Samaritanologists that were incredibly insular in their De Bruyter books. Blue book after blue book after blue book that no one read except them. So we have this group of ancient Israelites 
descendants of the northern tribes of Israel. Now, we used to try to say that maybe they weren't really descendants, but now there's enough archaeological evidence at Mount Rizim, their holy mountain, and uh, in other places like Wadi Dalia to sort of do the kiss. And we can see that these people go back to the northern tribes of Israel. They were about a third of the population in late antique Palestine. This is their Torah on the left. The Samaritan Torah is written in Samaritan script. This one's at the Museum of the Bible in Washington. It's from the um, 12th century. It's a very early one, except everything up above is new. There's this. Down below is the interesting part. Uh, their holy mountain, Mount Grizim, the place that God has chosen according to the Samaritan Torah, because it is different from the Jewish Torah. So they can't be Jews. Jews believe in Jerusalem, right? So they can't possibly be Jews. But there are Israelites with a separate mountain, the place where Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac, the place where Noah's Ark landed, the place where the tabernacle was hidden at the end of the days of goodness, waiting for the, for the coming, the return of Moses. Sound familiar, but backwards? On the right, or the next slide, the Samaritan sacrificial compound. Now, if you ask Jewish studies, it will tell you that it's a temple. But if you ask any Samaritan, they will say, we never had a temple because they have no memory of having had a temple from the sixth through the second century BCE. So the compromise I have made with Samaritans is that we're going to call it a Samaritan sacrificial compound. Okay. Now, the Samaritan sacrificial compound is not the octagon at the top. That's the church that was built on top. Rather, it's all of those staircases and rooms on the side. The Samaritan temple was destroyed, as we'll see, by John Hyrcanus around 112 BCE, which is not a way to win friends and influence people. Up above, you see Samaritans on pilgrimage on the three festivals, uh, Passover, Shavuot, and, and Sukkot. Down below, the place with the little boy where the uh, tabernacle once stood, and on the right, a 17th century drawing that luckily I just found at the... Uh, in the uh, National Museum, in the National Library in Moscow, that shows, again, the tabernacle, except in Samaritan script and Samaritan interpretation, with fascinating rhythmic parallels, but that's another conversation. And of course, everybody knows that's a Samaritan sacrifice, a Passover sacrifice every Passover. So it's not exactly what we do. Do not think that you can go there and see the ancient, the ancient way of sacrifice. They use very nice modern knives and they get the wood for the skewers at the lumber yard. In other words, it's not the same, but it's, again, a continuation and a sense of reality. Samaritans had been venerating Mount Grizim, the holy mountain, as long as anybody can remember. This is a stone that was found on the island of Delos in the Aegean. The Israelites on, the, on Delos who make offerings to the temple on Mount Grizim, with it, this guy's being honored with a gold crown. Pretty good. Samaritan synagogues, both on Mount Grizim on the left, on uh, Yom Kippur, and on and in Cologne. By the way, on the door of the window of Cologne, it says, welcome, welcome when you come and welcome when you leave in Deuteronomy. But here's the important part. Beginning in the 1950s and continuing, particularly in the 1980s, Samaritan synagogues were discovered all over the Holy Land. At the same time, Samaritan literature began to be published by linguists. And so when I was a graduate student, there were two great things that were happening. One was the publication of Samaritan literature and archaeology. The other was this publication of Putin. And so there was a massive construction, whether it be the reclaiming of Jewish, of the Dead Sea Scrolls for Jewish studies, whether it be the discovery of ancient synagogues, the 1980s where Stuart and I thrived most and where we developed was a period of amazing growth and development in Jewish studies all over the world. And so you see some of the Samaritan synagogues were all marked, there's a bunch of them all over. For time, I'm not gonna go through, but take a look, is that Jewish? No, it's Samaritan. It looks Jewish, it doesn't matter like it should be Jewish, right? It's not, it's Samaritan. Let's try another one. Now, this is a, a capital from a Torah shrine that was found in Amayos, which is um, if you go to, up to Jerusalem and pass a gas station on your left, the Paz Gaz, that's where Amayos is. Um, and, and what does it say in it? Baruch Shemo Le'olam, blessed be his name eternally, which is part of their liturgy to this day. 
uh, down below you see the Samaritan script, which yes, is an ancient biblical script. They like to call it Paleo Hebrew, but before whom, right? Uh, the ancient Samaritan script uh, maintained by Samaritans, which means, by the way, when Jews use a square script, it's also symbolic. It's not a neutral decision. Or down below, two very nice menorahs that could come from any Jewish context, except, of course, there's an image of Mount Rezim in the middle. Let's try the next one. Or this floor from Bet Shan, which looks just like the Jewish floor down below, corner, except the one down below has a lulav right here. You see it? Amphron, etro, right? Up here, there's none of that stuff. Why? Because Samaritans do not use the lulav and the etro on the festival of Sukkot. It took until the year 2000 to begin to figure that fact out. They thought this was a Jewish mosaic. Now, the Samaritan community is ruled by a high priest. Jews used to be ruled by a high priest, you know, but made a different decision. Who is holding the ultimate proof of Samaritan antiquity, a Torah scroll that they believe was written by the grandson of Aaron, the high priest, on Mount Rezim, 14 years after they came into the Holy Land, which is there. Moshe Kibel Torah Sinai. There is there Moses receives Torah from Sinai statement. It is the ultimate statement of authority. I just point out it is not that old, but that's not my problem, right? It's not certainly not their problem. And on the left, a lady praying before the scroll because it can do good things for you. It can be spiritually meaningful. And if you're far away from Mount Rezim and think of this scroll, it will help you. My point is only that Samaritan religion looks a lot like Jewish museum down to Samaritan stepped pools, which rabbis talk about and which we found all over Samaria. So you can find a mikvah and it doesn't necessarily mean that the person's Jewish and you can find a menorah and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's Jewish. Keep going. That's way the wrong way. That makes it harder. Okay. Now, of course, the problems start out with the destruction of uh, Mount Grisim by John Herkinus around 112. But the Samaritans become very famous during the Second Temple period because of a couple of very famous people. One of them yeah. called the Good Samaritan, the other is the woman at the well. One is in uh, Luke, the other in Luke, Matthew. The other one is in um, John. Is there a Good Samaritan hospital here? No. So it's not a Catholic city. Catholic cities always have a Samaritan hospitals. Now, Jews and Samaritans were adversaries through the Second Temple period. And I know my time is going, so I'm going to go quickly. Jews and Samaritans were adversaries through the Second Temple period. But with the destruction of the Second Temple, the relationship changed. And so we see, for example, Samaritans were treated as partial Israelites, never as Jews. Remember, Jews didn't call themselves Jews either. They called themselves Bnei Yisrael, and Samaritans called themselves Bnei Yisrael. So it's not so hard. Matzah of a kuti, a Samaritan matzah, can be eaten on Passover, according to this early rabbinic tradition, though not everybody liked it. But here's the important part, the last line. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, any commandment that the Samaritans have taken hold of, they are much more meticulous than Israel is, which means than we are. It's a very complex set of relationships, which by the fourth century is getting even more complex. Because as rabbis, as Stuart has written about, are consolidating in the third, late third and fourth centuries, as rabbis are developing their communities, developing the Great, great, great Academy in Tiberia, people who are not acceptable to the community of rabbis are excluded, like those Amaaretz people, those ignorant people that they don't like, which is why they're called it Amaaretz, or those Christians or the Samaritans. And so we have text after text after text that describes the relationship. Here's the problem. The city of Caesarea by the sea, Samaritans were probably the majority population. That's at least what Lee Levine thinks. They were probably majority population or they were a lot of them. That means Jews were in minority to Samaritans. You take Samaritans and Jews together, they were, they were counted more than non-Israelites. 
Okay. That caused rabbis in this city some difficulty. The most famous of them being Rabbi Abahu, the great sage of Tiberia, who forbade the drinking of Samaritan wine, but couldn't figure out why he was forbidding it. Example after example. Well, we don't drink their wine because you know they were drinking, they were drinking non-kosher wine on the Sabbath in Samaria. That's Samaria down below. Non, we can't drink their wine because when Diocletian came to visit, you know, the Jews wouldn't pour out wine libations to Diocletian, but they would. I just point out that the Jews had legal dispensation not to pour out wine to the emperor, but the Samaritans didn't. So not pouring out wine is a death sentence. It's illegal, it's treasonous, but it doesn't matter. They did it, and that's reason not to let their wine be acceptable anymore, which means they're not acceptable anymore. Now, let's go one step further. They pray to a dove. Now, this relates to the story. Why? Because we all know that Sepphoris is called Sepphoris. Why? Because it's like a bird sitting on top of a mountain. Now, take a look at the city of, Na of Nablus down below and Mount Grisim behind. You can imagine why someone would imagine a bird on top of the mountain that the Samaritans are praying to. You can imagine why they would come to that kind of distinction when this little group has this little stuff going on on top of the hill. And so over and over again, I'll just point out for anybody who's questioning it, um, on the left is a Samaritan man, uh, mosaic where you see a bird cage with nothing in it. In the middle is a Jewish mosaic uh, where you see there's a bird cage with a bird in it. And then there's a Christian one to the far side. In other words, Samaritans wouldn't even make pictures of, in, of animals where Jews would in their synagogues. My point in all of this, when the Samaritans came to Rabbi Abahu and asked him, why aren't you drinking my wine? They said, uh, you drink, he said to them, your fathers didn't corrupt their deeds the way you do. You've corrupted yours. Now who changed, Rabbi Abahu or the Samaritans? It's not clear to me at all. But the point is by the third century, by the fourth century, we begin to find rabbis separated. So what do you do with Samaritans? They do not fit under complex common Judaism, but they look an awful lot like Jews and they do not look like those Christians and pagans. So we have to come up with a term for them. Complex, common, the complex is Stuart, the common is mine. So Israelite religion. In other words, we need to think in terms of an even a broader group of categories that includes Samaritans as part of this dynamic this incredible dynamic of two Israelite peoples living in the Holy Land in the world of late antiquity, intersecting, interacting, disliking, fighting, working together as relatives do. But they're very different than the Christians and the polytheists of Palestine. After all, they are all children in their own self-belief and self-understanding of the entire community of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, Stuart, in dealing with this issue of common Judaism and then complex common Judaism, we have had this conversation now for as long as Aviva has almost been alive. <clears throat> And in fact, I had it with class, with Aviva in class. It's an astonishing thing. And it's a conversation that has made me think differently about what the work that I do. And I hope it's been useful to you as well because it's been enriching and it's been enlightening. And most of all, it's been an awful lot of fun. And I don't intend to let it end. Because after all, you are a fellow of our Yeshiva University Center for Israel Studies. So come to New York. <laughs> now, not okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fine. Um, wait, let me make sure I can do this correctly. Uh, okay, great. Um, and one moment, I'm just going to let in some more people from the waiting room. All right, perfect. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Professor Fine, uh, uh, for uh, your.
complex comment analysis integration of your work and uh, Stuart's work, really a fantastic uh, sort of uh, combination of, of this. And yes, uh, we uh, let me just mention that we have one more speaker now, and then we're going to take a short break. Uh, people need to get up or get something to drink or get a, get a snack. Um, so uh, our, our third uh, speaker in our scholarly uh, symposium is uh, our next Professor Miller. Uh, we are very excited to welcome our newest uh, Professor Miller. I just want to mention that um, a prerequisite for the search that we had for Professor Miller's uh, position was that it did not need to be a Professor Miller. <laughs> you know, so you never know with how job descriptions are written, but it was very fortuitous and, and we're, we're quite fortunate and quite lucky uh, to have identified a wonderful candidate uh, who uh, coincidentally will be our next our next Professor Miller. You know, when I think of uh, Miller's Tale, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales that we're writing here in this uh, 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 medieval surroundings, perhaps, uh, or Miller to Miller might be a great double play combination in, in the middle of the diamond, I don't know, but um, it's really a, an honor to, to welcome Professor Yoni Miller, uh, who is going to be uh, joining our faculty formally uh, in Hebrew and Judaic studies uh, this coming August, but who has just moved to our community here in West Hartford basically two days ago. Uh, so uh, we're uh, delighted to welcome uh, Professor Yoni Miller to the University of Connecticut and to uh, West Hartford. Of course, uh, Yoni Miller joins us from the University of Toledo in Northwest Ohio, where he was most recently the Philip Markowitz Endowed Assistant Professor of Judaism and Jewish Biblical Studies and the Director of the Center for Religious Understanding at the University of Toledo. He's originally from Teaneck, New Jersey, and he earned his uh, BA from Yeshiva University, Summa Cum Laude in Judaic Studies. He spent two years as a visiting graduate student at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and went on to complete both an MA and PhD in Ancient Judaism at Harvard University under the tutelage of Professor Thaya Cohen. After completing his PhD, he held a Harry Starr Fellowship at Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. Yoni's research and teaching understand interests span from the Hebrew Bible through the Cairo Geniza. He's interested broadly in the first millennium of Jewish biblical interpretation with specific interest in post-destruction literature on the Israelite priesthood, as well as the history of the modern study of ancient Judaism. He's recently published a translation of the Mishnah Yoma, which is going to be published, uh, Mishnah Yoma, which is going to be published in the Oxford Annotated Mishnah. And he has an article forthcoming in Hartford, uh, in Hartford, <laughs> Her 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 uh, Hartford <laughs> Theological Review. He's currently working on a monograph entitled Rewriting Priestly Authority in Late Antiquity. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome Professor Yoni Miller, who will be uh, speaking today on New Light on the Kohen and the First Aliyah. Welcome. Thank you, Avi, for that uh, very warm and generous introduction. And I, I'm just thrilled uh, to be here. Um, it's a very interesting point uh, in my life, in my professional career. Uh, we're still in boxes. Um, I was just telling Sebastian that we haven't found our bath towels yet, but you know we're we're well on our way. Um, and it is just a, it's such a delight. Um, to be nourished intellectually, as I would use the metaphor, um, from so many of, of my virtual teachers, um, a, a number of the speakers and guests in this room are people who I regularly, whose work I regularly read uh, and footnote, and of course, um, Stuart, uh, we are here to honor you today. Um, the year is about 2009 to 2010. And the AJS conference is being held in Boston. And at that time, I'm doing my PhD at Harvard. I'm living in Brookline, Massachusetts. 
And with a group of friends, uh, we're having deli sandwiches at Ruben's, uh, the kosher deli on, uh, on Harvard Street. And I'm facing, facing the front door and a man approaches, um, tall, thin, he's wearing a trench coat, he has tinted glasses, and he walks into the restaurant. And I said, holy moly, Richard Belzer just walked into the restaurant. <laughs> so Richard Belzer walks into Ruben's and then sits down at a table with Stephen Fraud and a number of the other Jewish studies professors who were there. And I said, holy moly, Richard Belzer is in the Jewish studies. <laughs> in any event, someone had told me subsequently that uh, the person whom I had confused with Detective Munch was none other than uh, Professor Stuart Miller. Um, and from that point onward, I just couldn't shake the association. Um, so that was my first introduction to you uh, in person. Um, and then subsequently, obviously, I've had the pleasure um, of, of uh, reading your work and hearing the conference presentations. And it, it struck me um, after hearing Sebastian's remarks um, when, when my wife and I came here to visit after I was offered the position um, here at UConn, we came to visit a few months ago and I'm almost certain uh, the first thing that we did after stepping off the plane and having lunch uh, was Stuart insisted on having us over to his home uh, where we sat for over an hour uh, with Stuart and with Laura, uh, with a fire blazing, um, seeing the musical instruments, being introduced to a side of Stuart that I uh, really didn't know previously. Uh, we talked shop and played Jewish geography. We're not related, but we uh, know many people in common. Uh, and it was just, it's such a delight. I had, there obviously, uh, you can see how I might feel um, having to step into these big shoes. Um, it feels intimidating in this setting. Uh, however, Stuart made me feel at ease um, and welcome um, as he did when we spoke. Um, a few weeks prior on campus. So I just wanted to thank you um, for uh, inviting us into your home. And I look forward to being your neighbor uh, once I figure out um, the, the directions. Um, so I, I must say um, that the, I'm, apparently I'm one of the keynote speakers and uh, keynote has a very different meaning in Hebrew than it does in English. So I'm just gonna go with the Hebrew meaning. So let me just offer a, a, a lamentation uh, for a moment. Um, so you know, they hired me. So you, you know, you hear a lot of I've always wanted to give a keynote speech about the keynote. Um, I think I will do that one day. Uh, so this is um, the first time in my adult life that I am without a computer. Um, and I had to return it to my previous employer and practically my entire library um, has been and remains in boxes along with my other uh, worldly possessions. Um, so my remarks today, um, I unfortunately um, wasn't able to uh, prepare um, remarks of the depth and caliber that were presented previously, however, on the bright side, they will be short. <laughs> um, and uh, my remarks will be impressionistic, maybe even homiletical. Uh, I'm the son and grandson uh, of rabbis, so that can happen as well, um, but, I, but I digress. Um, so we all know why we're here, hopefully. Um, we are here to honor Stuart Miller uh, after his uh, retirement from a long, and productive career at the University of Connecticut. Now, let us suppose that when the invitation was sent out, um, that it said something to the effect that this gathering was being held uh, in order to keep everyone happy, in order to keep the peace. That's why we're honoring Stuart Miller. So first and foremost, I have no doubt that our honoree would find that hurtful. 
it would completely undercut the premise that the honoree is at the center of the event. Rather, the honoree uh, is the honoree and the event are serving as an expedient means for something else entirely. Which brings me to the topic of my remarks today. The other speakers have spoken about the priesthood. Um, I'd like to talk briefly uh, about the tradition of Kohanim, priests, the male descendants of the biblical Aaron, uh, their entitlement to receive the first aliyah, their entitlement to be called to the Torah first. Uh, so in Orthodox uh, synagogue, in Orthodox congregation, this honor is still bestowed regularly. And in fact, uh, were one, uh, were a male, uh, adult male, to visit a new Orthodox synagogue, uh, they would likely be greeted with a handshake and then promptly asked if they were a Kohen or Levi. Um, obviously, uh, that, that would be good information for uh, the Gabbai to know. Uh, Conservative congregations uh, can elect to honor the Kohen with the first aliyah. Many do not. Um, the reform movement sees the hereditary priesthood um, as antithetical to its egalitarian founding ideals, and therefore um, no such honor exists uh, in the reform movement. So first and foremost, the custom of calling people up to the Torah uh, is a rabbinic uh, innovation. Um, it, at its inception, it's also different from how we might imagine uh, the uh, an, an aliyah, right? When a person was called up to the Torah, they were called up both to uh, issue the blessings and to read, um, and to read from um, the designated portion. So they didn't have a designated reader uh, as many congregations today. So the practice, where does this practice come from? Calling uh, the Kohen first. Uh, so the source is in the Mishnah, Mishnah Tractate 18, Chapter 5, Mishnah 8. Um, and it states, it reads as follows. The Elu on Rum Darke Shalom. These were things that were stated uh, in the name of the, literally the ways of peace. Kohen Kore Rishon, the Kohen reads first, the Aharav Levi, after him a Levite, the Aharav Yisrael, and after him a lay Israelite, Mipne Darke Shalom. Because so as to keep the peace. That sounds very nice, uh, doesn't it? But is it an honor? The fact that the Kohen receives the first aliyah, if it is done, mipnei darke shalom, is the Kohen in fact being honored with the first aliyah? So among the other practices mentioned uh, in that same mission, practices that, that are maintained in order to keep their feet, are things like allowing a trapper to keep the animals in their trap, despite the fact that anyone that, according to the letter of the law, anyone who were to come across the trap, because it's in, I guess, I'm assuming public land, would be able to take uh, the animal, the trapped animal, because um, of Talmudic ownership laws, so essentially, there is a legal theoretical principle here. It is not an honor to the trapper that he is allowed to keep the animal in his trap. There is a legal theoretical principle operating here, according to which the rabbis can make assignments of entitlements or possessions that override normative rabbinic law as long as these assignments and entitlements have some kind of social benefit. So again, if the rabbis assign the first aliyah to the, to, a, to the Kohen, okay, is the Kohen in fact entitled to that aliyah or is it assigned to the Kohen in order to being expedient means towards maintaining some kind of social order, whatever that means. And it's really quite interesting in the ensuing discussion in the Babylonian Talmud, the rabbis really struggle 
uh, with this law. They seek a proof text. Uh, and there are four different proof texts that are invoked. The first three of which really don't have anything to do with honoring the Kohen. And the fourth one comes from Leviticus chapter 21, verse 8. And this is what, if you were to ask a Kohen, why did you get the first Aliyah? This is what they would say. That according to Leviticus 21, 8, the Kiddush Ko, that there is an imperative to honor the priest. And because of the imperative to honor the priest, the priest gets to read first. Now, the problem with this in, uh, uh, verse is immediately seized upon by the Talmud itself. If the reason that we assign the first aliyah to the priest is the verse, the Kiddush Ko, then why does the Mishnah say, Mipnei Darkei Shalom? Why does the Mishnah have a motive clause that the Kohen gets the first aliyah because of this societal peace reason, if in fact it is a uh, it is derived from a biblical verse? And it's never truly resolved. Uh, it's never truly resolved uh, in, in the Talmud. And there is this uneasiness. Just as there is uneasiness throughout rabbinic literature uh, when it comes to relations between uh, rabbis and priests, of course, priests being one of the themes, priests in rabbinic literature being one of the themes uh, that Stuart um, has addressed in so much of his scholarship. Um, so the question, I think, is, is somewhat unresolved. Um, I would not recommend uh, telling your local Kohen uh, that they are not entitled to the first Aliyah. That might create some problems for you. Um, uh, however, I, I, what I do want to say, um, and this is where we might branch into homily, um, Stuart, is that the, the, the honor that you are being uh, bestowed today, um, the honor by your teachers, your colleagues, your students, your successor, uh, these, these are honors, honors to which you are truly entitled. They are not being assigned or reassigned. They are not circumventing any mechanisms, you have earned all of the plaudits uh, and all of um, all of the warmth and, and the happiness uh, that is in this room today. So I, 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 I am very um, grateful to you uh, for welcoming me into this community. Uh, I can only hope to accomplish, uh, I would say a fraction of what you've accomplished, but I would say many times, many times over what you've accomplished, uh, and I wish you the best of luck in your retirement. That's all to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yoni. Wonderful and uh, wonderful to welcome you to the community and a wonderful tribute to, uh, to Stuart. Um, so I think what we'll do at this moment, we're going to transition to some Zoom uh, remarks and greetings from people over Zoom. Uh, but we've been sitting for a while. If people want to take, maybe we'll take a short five-minute break. Uh, if you want to get up, stretch your legs, grab a drink, grab a snack, I'll make sure the Zoom greetings work, and then we'll reconvene. Okay? Thank you. Yes. Do you buy any chanty? We're back to, to reporting the program. So, um, as as uh, as you've heard in our uh, discussion today, uh, Professor Miller's impact has uh, been one that has been obviously uh, local here in in uh, Greater Hartford and in the University of Connecticut and in the state of Connecticut, but also uh, has a reach that is indeed global uh, in nature. And uh, what is very fortunate about the world that we live in today is that when we do a program like this, we are able to also welcome in um, speakers uh, from around the country and indeed around the world, some of whom are joining us uh, late, late at night. So um, we have greetings uh, from close friends, colleagues, uh, collaborators, and former students who are uh, joining us uh, from around the world. So 
um, for the first uh, speaker from our uh, greetings section to offer some comments on uh, years of collaboration and some scholarly insights on the collaborations that they've had together is Professor Michael Swartz. Um, Michael uh, Swartz specializes in the cultural history of uh, Judaism in late antiquity, uh, rabbinic studies, early Jewish mysticism and magic, and ritual studies. Uh, he is a professor uh, in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at The Ohio State uh, University. He's the author of numerous works, including uh, The Mechanics of Providence, The Workings of Ancient Jewish Magic and Mysticism in 2018, The Signifying Creator, Non-Textual Sources of Meaning in Ancient Judaism in 2012, Scholastic Magic, Ritual and Revolution and Early Jewish Mysticism, 1996, and Mystical Prayer in Ancient Judaism in 1992. Uh, he's also uh, served as the associate editor for Judaica for the second edition of the Encyclopedia of Religion. Uh, I believe Michael is currently joining us from Paris, if I'm not mistaken. So Michael, thank you so much uh, for zooming in uh, from Paris, and hopefully we'll all be able to hear you in the room. Go ahead and uh, turn the mic, the screen over to you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Hello? I can hear you. That's what I needed to know. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Ari, and everybody at the uh, University of Connecticut for inviting me. Uh, as uh, we know, I'm said, I'm speaking to you from Paris, uh, where I'm spending a couple of weeks doing research here. Uh, I'm sorry that I could not join you in Hartford to share in this symposium. Okay, that's not quite right. Right. I'm sorry that all of you could not join me here in Paris for the celebration. Uh, you have to be uh, honest here. One way or the other, it is honestly an honor and pleasure to take uh, part in this symposium. Um, I'm not sure when I first met Stuart uh, Miller. Of course, I was a grad student at NYU, uh, but I do remember that when I was a beginning uh, grad student there, our professor, uh, Frank Peters, the late Peters, invited Stuart to visit our seminar. I believe that Stuart had just finished his dissertation on Sepphoris or was about to finish it. Just the, summer, uh, the seminar was on cities of the Near East. Uh, Stuart presented an elegant case study showing how a historian can make sense of the complex network of intersecting stories scattered in rabbinic sources about the city. Uh, and uh, Professor Schiffman has told you what a difficult task and diplomatic task that was. And I remember Frank Peters modeling, this is fun. Now I see why those guys on the sub uh, subway sit with their comrades on their laps. Uh, we didn't have the heart to tell them the truth. Yes. What Stuart has been doing all these years is fun, and at least he makes it look like fun. It has inspired many of us classmates, colleagues, and students, as we can see today. More than this, Stuart's work has exemplified the innovations of what became a new generation of scholars of Judaism, Jews, and their uh, neighbors in late antiquity. At NYU, we, were, we, who were the first of that generation, learned to go beyond the world of textual analysis without abandoning it. From Frank Peters, we gained an urbanist perspective that sees authors and actors as members of complex symbiotic communities. From the late Baruch Levine, we learned that uh, Leviticus was actually the most interesting book of the Torah. And from Larry Schiffman, of course, we learned many things, including the lesson that no Jewish source is too out of the mainstream or difficult to be taken seriously. I feel over the years, our field has developed new methods, new evidence, and crucial to uh, Stewart's research, urbanic new archaeological and material finds. We're no longer the new generation, but still, thanks to the increase, uh, increasing availability of, uh, of new materials and new uh, methodologies, we're still learning from the insights that Stuart has brought to the study of Judaism in late antiquity. 
I'd like to mention briefly a few intersections with my own work and that of my colleagues. Now, as somebody who's proud to call myself an NYU product and a close student of uh, uh, a close colleague and student of uh, students and uh, our other uh, colleagues, I present these marks from a very similar but slightly different perspective. Excuse me. No, I find in Stewart's work, and in Stewart's work, an acknowledgement of the complexity of ancient societies. I've argued that much of the historiography of Judaism in Palestine and Babylonian and Babylonia late antiquity has fallen into two basic paradigms we heard about uh, a little bit earlier. One is the paradigm of what I call majoritarianism, the attempt to determine the loyalties of uh, the majorities of Jews in the rabbinic orbit. This usually entails either the maximalist depiction of the rabbis as the sole determinants of Judaism for the entire society, or a minimalist portrait of a cloister elite uh, that stood against the incoherent masses. Uh, most, more recently, there's also emerged uh, what I call denominationalism, consisting of specters of rabbinic, synagogue, Enochic, Jews, and so on. And you heard from earlier roots. So its major work, I would argue, complicate this picture. In fact, I would argue that his most recent work offers an intriguing prospect of a kind of rabbinics from the bottom up with his nuanced exploration of the role of custom in shaping the, uh, and determining relationships between rabbis um, and others and in the shaping of halakha. In my own work, I found myself engaging in what I might call rabbinics from the outside in. I've concentrated on such materials outside the conventional rabbinic canon as early uh, Jewish mystical texts, Jewish magic, and the literature of Piyut, formal synagogue poetry. I'm interested in what will happen if we allow those texts to stand for themselves as responses to the needs in their authors and uh, of their authors and clients. One way or another, Stuart has contributed substantially to a new conception of ancient Jewish society. As I said, studying at NYU alerted us to the centrality of cultic concerns in both biblical and post-biblical religion. Stewart's work reflected this awareness from the beginning with his analysis of evidence, both for and against, mostly as you heard, against the active role of priests and priesthood and sephirs, and through his consideration of purity and purification as factors in understanding schools in ancient Palestine. I'm particularly interested in his consideration of varying forms of purity, among different sectors of the Jewish population. I've explored uh, alternative paradigms for purity in esoteric literature, from magical formulas and hateful light to such non-canonical works as Brighta Danita. In addition, research, recent research on the prominence of sacrificial piety um, uh, and priestly themes uh, in early period suggests that the temple cult and the status of the priesthood did impact the content, if not the social makeup, of Judaism in late antiquity. Finally, Miller has served as a model of a textual scholar who is able to think creatively about the implications of material finds and integrate them into a coherent, dare I say, three-dimensional image. Stewart was able to take advantage of the happy occurrence of his expertise in textual sources on Sephirates and uh, its environs and the spectacular archaeological finds that emerged after his dissertation in a singularly sophisticated way, being involved literally from the ground up, from the beginning. This work comes at a time when there is a new emphasis on materiality, the properties of material sources themselves in the study of religion and cultures. This so-called new materialism, a kind of pushback from the previous trend of interpreter-based pan-textualism, stresses that things will have their say, that our cultures are the product of interactions between the goals of cultural producers and the properties of the things 
increasingly aware of the materials that I work with, especially amulets, magical bowls, papyri, and divination texts, as objects meant for use by practitioners in ritual and social contexts. And Stewart's work has helped a great deal in that regard. So for all these reasons, the study of Judaism is much richer for Stuart Miller's prodigious contributions. And we have even more reason to celebrate the prospect of ever more trailblazing scholarship, not to mention, me, not to mention lovely guitar music during Stuart's retirement. Muscle time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And uh, I'm so happy that uh, even though you weren't able to be here in person for the program, you're able to join us uh, virtually from Paris. Um, and we're all uh, on our way to visit you there. So thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, as, as we've heard, we're really uh, honored to, to have a number of uh, very distinguished uh, speakers who are joining us for this scholarly uh, symposium. And <laughs> Um, Stuart's wonderful contributions uh, to the field. And so I'm um, very pleased to welcome, uh, again, via Zoom, Eric and Carol Myers, uh, who you can see on the, on the screen, are here to uh, join us to offer uh, greetings. Uh, by way of introduction, Eric Myers uh, received uh, a PhD with distinction from Harvard University in Near Eastern Languages and Literature, specializing in Bible, Jewish history, and archaeology. He served on the active faculty of uh, Duke University from 1969 to 2015, where he was professor since 1979, and is presently the Bernice and Morton Lerner Emeritus Professor of Judaic Studies and Archaeology. He served as director of the graduate program there in religion from 1979 to 85, associate director, uh, and uh, became director again uh, in 2001, a position he held until 2007. Eric Myers is the recipient of several prestigious awards and has authored or co-authored 15 books, edited 20 others, and has published approximately 370 scholarly papers, reports, and reviews in the field of Hebrew Bible and biblical archaeology and Jewish history. One of his most recent published works is the final report on the Sephoris, which appeared in 2018. Um, the Mary Grace Wilson Professor Emerita of Religion at Duke and has lectured widely in subject and gender in the biblical world. A prolific author, she's the author of more than 450 articles, reports, reference book entries and reviews, and has authored, co-authored, or edited 22 uh, books. Um, so it's a uh, welcome. Eric and Carol Myers. Well, we are. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Noam, you you were breaking up every other word. I'd like to know that what I'm saying everyone through. can hear and is not breaking up. Can you confirm that you can hear me? I confirm. Okay, we're breaking up on this uh, over here. Stuart and I go back many years. And our friendship was inspired by his work on Sipori, <clears throat> on Sepphoris, because after nearly a decade and a half in the Upper Galilee in the Mayron excavation project, excavating four synagogues, our team had decided to move to the urban city, Jewish city in Galilee of, of Sepphoris. Especially attractive was its rich pedigree of literary sources that would help guide us to understanding the finds that were ultimately uncovered there. The discipline of matching up rabbinic literature with material culture and finds was pioneered over a hundred years ago by the great German Jewish scholar Shmuel Krauss, whose multi-volume work Talmudische Archaeologie really inspired much of my work and I'm sure had an outsized influence on all of Stewart's work. 
our collaboration in together when Stuart joined the dig as Talmudist and mentor of many students brought Talmudical archaeology, in my view, to a new level. And uh, Professor Schwartz has just described that new level. And that's a very pleasant coincidence to hear it. So in going to Tsipori, we declared a whole new ball game on this field. And the outsized number and kinds of discoveries that we made really uh, enchanted all of us and brought, brought us to a new level. Stuart took the challenge of being part of the dig, bringing his students. Uh, we enjoyed having the Yukon students with us. We enjoyed Stuart teaching his students, our students on the dig. Carol will mention more about that and his lectures in the evenings on the dig as well. So what biblical archaeology had done for about 150 years, bringing texts and monuments together in dialogue, we really addressed this challenge for the Greco-Roman period in a new way that had been neglected, and I think have proved our mettle in the dozens, if not 100 publications or so, which have emanated just from our dig. With 30 mikvahs discovered, mikvahot, ritual baths, discovered on the Western Summit site, uh, Stuart became engaged in a level of understanding material culture that we had not imagined possible from this textual man of letters. But it was his article, The Non-Monolithic Mikvah, which led him to move to, to the next level. And uh, that next level emerged in a book and in a major chapter in our final publication published by Penn State University Press Eisenbrown imprint in 2018. There, Carol, well, there, 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 there it is. But together with all of this research, a deep and lasting personal friendship between our families at and the three of us, because we spent all that time in the field together, emerged and resulted in enormous mutual respect for each of our disciplines and our engagement with university life. In the end, Stuart became a field person and he had his own dig. As you, many of you know, a disco chance discovery in Connecticut, my home state, led him to lead a investigation and field project into a more recent mikvah uh, in that area. He's also engaged in more recent study of Judaism by probing into the work of Philip Roth and his own origins in Newark, New Jersey, and I admire his attempt to do that so successfully. Stuart, I, I salute you for all you've done. You've worn the crown of Torah with dignity, and now you wear the crown of archeology span with additional dose of dignity. We wish you and your family well, good health, especially, in what I know will be a very, very active retirement. Sir, I wish we could see you. I guess you can see us on a screen up there somewhere, but we can't see you at all. Wish we could. Uh, I don't really have much more to add uh, to what Eric has said. I second and third and fourth and fifth ad infinitum everything that he has said about the importance of your scholarship in this field. Uh, I still remember when Eric was a beginning graduate student and was also doing archaeology, being so frustrated with the way scholars of early Judaism were so text focused that they never thought about the material world. And in many ways, you finally, for him, uh, resolved that question and showed him that, yes, Talmudic textual scholars could 
and would and were taking the material culture seriously. So that, that's a remarkable contribution to your specific field and in general to the notion of the interplay between uh, the written word and the field of material remains. Your presence on the dig for those years in the 1990s, um, having our families intersect a bit was really lovely for our Duke students to come in contact with students from other universities next to each other in the trenches and getting to know them and widening their experience. And your interactions with your own students was really something commendable. It was not unnoticed by us. Uh, in addition to the evening lectures that Eric mentioned, um, where you introduced all, all of us to various aspects of the study of early Judaism and, and late antiquity, antique Judaism, <laughs> you came around in the field. You were not digging with a pick and hammer the way you eventually did in Connecticut, but you were <clears throat> located on box. I hope all of you know what a balk is. It's the earthen section that's left when archaeologists go dig a, down in a trench. And you instituted what probably is a unique form of academic discourse, the balk talk. <laughs> <laughs> you came around to all the trenches and stopped. And there were your students, our students, other students were there. They were told not to stop working. That would be terrible but to listen carefully and since they're also good at multitasking they they indeed did that and your bot talks were a highlight of the digging experience for many of the people that were there we appreciate very much how you kept in touch with us over the years um i with eric and, and ben gordon we were the three editors of this sephiris final report and i did the actual editing of your uh Chat, your wonderful chapter, which was a pleasure to read. I have to say that going over all the, the chapters, yours was about the easiest to edit it because it was so well thought out and so well written to begin with. So you've kept in touch with us. Um, we've appreciated during COVID checking in to see how we're doing and letting us know about your expanding family, which I guess is still expanding. Yay. Yay. <laughs> And we wish you the best in your family life, in your community life, in your academic life as you move on to this next phase. All the best, Koltuv. Let me this now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eric and, and Carol. Uh, we're so happy that you were able to, to join us uh, for virtually for the program today. And thank you for your warm remarks and reflections. And I, I have to say, I, I learned something new. I was not familiar with the, the concept of the Bach talk. So, um, but maybe classical guitar, classical music, Bach talk, I don't know. Anyway, different, different concept. So um, as, as we've heard so much about um, Stuart's wonderful contributions to scholarship and uh, to the field, uh, you've also heard that Stuart has made a tremendous impact uh, over the course of 40 years at the University of Connecticut on generations of students uh, that he has educated. Uh, we heard uh, Susan Herb who uh, read some of those uh, student reviews, those Rate My Professor reports uh, that described Stuart as the most awesome uh, professor. And um, Stuart, as, as I mentioned before, really has been the architect of our Hebrew and Judaic Studies program, our major or minor or MA or PhD program, um, and instituted a class at uh, UConn, which is now called uh, Who Are the Jews? Jewish Identity Through the Ages, um, that I'm sure thousands of students have taken uh, over, over the years at, at UConn. So uh, we had to, uh, it's really an honor to be able to include some of your former students uh, from the University of Connecticut who are going on to great things uh, in their careers to share their reflections and to share uh, greetings. So first, I'm pleased to welcome Emma Barnes. Emma, we can now see you on uh, the screen here, who is a recent uh, graduate of 
of Yukon um, and is now uh, pursuing her uh, continued uh, doctorate at Oxford University. And I think is joining us right now from Oxford, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So uh, I'm going to turn the screen over to you, Emma, please. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm afraid I never left a Rate My Professor's Review for Professor Miller, um, <laughs> but I want to share some remarks now. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me to participate in the symposium today. It is an absolute pleasure to be here, even on Zoom. Um, I actually think my dad is in the room. Um, I wish I could be there too, um, but it is, a, it is a pleasure to be able to pay tribute to Professor Miller's exceptional scholarship and mentoring both of which have had a great informative impact on my career. So when I first met Professor Miller in early 2019 at UConn, I was just an undergraduate with a lot of ideas and interests. Now, as Professor Pat has said, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford, still with a lot of ideas and interests, but my work is now in the area of late Second Temple uh, Judaism and early Christianity. And this PhD follows on a two-year master's degree I completed here last year in Judaism and Christianity in the Greco-Roman world. I think it is safe to say that I wouldn't be at Oxford without Professor Miller, who not only very kindly and early on facilitated my being able to learn ancient Greek, but who has also gone from being my professor to my professor, mentor, and crash course biblical Hebrew instructor to my mentor, and I think also to a friend, if I may say so. I first met Professor Miller when I took HEJS 1103, as we just heard, otherwise known as Who Are the Jews? And I remember telling Professor Miller at this first class that I was interested, as many people are, in biblical archaeology. After class, he sent me a link to an online edX Oxford uh, course on this topic, and I remember being quite grateful and happy to see this in my email inbox. So being so grateful and happy about this, the next time we had class, I thanked Professor Miller for his attentiveness and told him that I would welcome any additional resources he had or knew of like this, which may be of interest to me, to which he said, and that I remember this very well, yes, well, I'm very busy, you know. Uh, so I was appropriately humbled that day, um, but this did not deter me. And I'm sure Professor Miller would confirm that I am quite persistent. Um, but this day in the spring semester of 2019, was indeed the start of an academic and personal relationship that has nourished and guided my path ever since, and which has generally been a steady presence to which I can always turn and return. This is especially true because one of the things I appreciate most about Professor Miller is his indefatigable dedication to his students and to their edification and growth, both in and outside of the classroom. And I know that for me, and he knows this as well, this manifests most clearly in the fact that I often approach Professor Miller with laundry lists of things I've been thinking about from ideas, interests, plans, decisions, and so forth. Um, and he never fails to challenge me, to make me think about things from different angles, to offer guidance, and to keep me grounded. So I do often feel calm and grateful and just generally better after I run things by Professor Miller. And it was in part by running one of these long lists by Professor Miller that I ended up at Oxford, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and Oxford has not been able to escape Professor Miller over the years either. His scholarship has played a significant role in my own work here, and both of my supervisors would confirm its presence in at least half of my essays each term. Indeed, after reading one of my papers on the rabbis, I remember Martin Goodman chuckling and saying he was not surprised at all to hear about Sepphoris. But there was really no way around it because from expounding the critical and eminently sensible concept of complex common Judaism, to expanding our archeological and literary knowledge of Sepphoris, as we have heard, Professor Miller's scholarship has contributed greatly to our understanding of Judaism in the Greco-Roman period. And I myself have always valued Professor Miller's sobriety in approaching historical sources, as well as his depth and breadth of knowledge of the period and Jewish history more widely, even up to Philip Roth, as we have heard. But more importantly, I cannot escape the fact that Professor Miller is the kind of professor who really makes a difference. As a teacher, mentor, and person, I don't know where I would be without Professor Miller's seemingly infinite generosity, kindness, sense of humor, and like I've said, his availability to help me out when I have questions, concerns, doubts, ideas, and so forth, and to offer resources, ideas, feedback, advice, and guidance of his own in return, even long after I have left UConn. So I just want to give two quick examples of this, the first being more concrete. I remember one Zoom call in 2020 during my first year of the master's at Oxford, 
when Professor Miller and I were discussing potential dissertation topics I had been tossing around. After the call, I went to sleep. It was late in the UK. And the next morning, I woke up to at least four follow-up emails and 10 to 12 PDFs, subject line from the Miller Library and Archives, um, which gave me a good chuckle when I saw them. Anyway, I saved them all and read them on the plane a few days later when I went home for Christmas. And the second is a little more abstract, but very important to me, and I wanted to, to share it. So in addition to the copious guidance on life in academia, Professor Miller has always thoughtfully shared reflections and experiences on what it means to live between the worlds of faith and academia, and how to navigate, reconcile, and live fully in each. Um, and this kind of advice has been invaluable to me time and again, especially as I have grown back into my Catholic faith here in Oxford. Um, and I'm left with no doubt really considering all of these qualities that I so appreciate about Professor Miller, that many other students have appreciated them as well. I'm certain that Professor Miller's students over the years have left both the classroom feeling much more intellectually stimulated and enriched, and his office feeling much more confident and engaged than he might have realized. So for someone who has had such an impact on my life and career, it is the least I can do to honor Professor Miller today and to wish him all the best in retirement. Congratulations. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, for, for sharing those uh, warm, heartfelt remarks and, and reflections. Uh, so it's a, a pleasure to uh, welcome another recent uh, student of uh, Professor Miller, uh, Mateus Machado Rico. Um, so uh, Mateus uh, completed his uh, master's uh, thesis at the University of Connecticut under Professor Miller's supervision. Mateus is a, a native of, of Brazil, born in Brasilia, uh, and uh, is a law student, a lawyer who worked in the uh, Brazilian uh, Superior Court and then transitioned to the field of Judaic studies. Uh, his MA thesis examined the Mishnah's depiction of the uh, judicial system as it existed in Roman Palestine. And he's now uh, working on his PhD at New York University, uh, examining the development of rabbinic literature and law. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Mateus Machado Rinko. Thank you, Professor, for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to honor Professor Miller. It is truly a honor to contribute to the celebration of Professor Miller's uh, legacy. It is a bittersweet moment as the University of Connecticut bids farewell to someone who has made such a significant impact on the institution. As already mentioned, Professor Miller has been a guiding force for so many, for so many students and colleagues for more than 40 years. His own waver and dedication to the development of the field of Judaic studies at UConn has left a lasting impression. Um, we already heard today how the establishment of a Judaic studies program in the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life is in no small measure the result of his efforts. I want to take a moment to express my sincere gratitude for everything that Professor Miller has done. Rather than rehearse all his contributions to the field of Jewish history or to the University of Connecticut, which has already been done extensively today, I thought I would give a brief account of how he has impacted my life in the last few years after he crossed paths. When I first contacted Professor Miller, I was a rookie lawyer back in Brazil, here I am right now, with an MA degree in Jewish studies. I was not sure what to do next, but I knew I wanted to pursue an academic career in ancient Judaism. And I also knew that I did not want to be a lawyer. I saw this solidifying consensus on the field concerning the role of the rabbis in ancient Jewish society as leaning in the wrong direction, especially due to a lack of proper consideration of the rabbinic sources. Professor Miller's was one of the few voices giving the proper way to both archeological and textual evidence. Once I realized UConn had a graduate program, it felt only natural to contact him. In my search, I had written to a few programs concerning my desire to go back to school, but Professor Miller's response was one of the most encouraging I got. Right from the start, however, 
He seemed more concerned with providing me with all the information necessary for a careful decision as to whether the program was right for me than with selling it. Once I arrived at UConn, I found in Professor Miller a true mentor. He would spend much of his time in conversations with me, even though, as Emma reminded us, he was very busy, elaborating on the topics we had seen in class and on reading recommendations I should pick up. He offered copious commentary on my work, including my master's thesis, the drafts of which he must have read a hundred times, and also more consequential papers, such as the ones I submitted as in my PhD applications. I had the pleasure of serving as Professor Miller's TA and was struck by his exceptional teaching abilities. He displayed a genuine commitment to helping his students comprehend the material, which he taught with enthusiasm. I was particularly impressed by his unwavering attention to students who struggled the most. Professor Miller dedicated extra time and effort to support the weakest students with the goal of bringing them up to speed. Professor Miller, Professor Miller encouraged me and saw to it I had the, main, the means to attend conferences and participate in summer programs, which broadened my horizons and allowed me to network with other graduate students and professionals of the field. When it was time to consider PhD programs, he offered me his candid advice on where to apply and which professors to approach. His invaluable guidance helped me immensely in making an informed decision. I am deeply grateful for the letter of recommendation he wrote on my behalf, which even though I didn't read, must have been generous as it played a significant role in my acceptance into several programs. It was a moment of sheer joy when I received the acceptance into NYU, his alma mater, and he continues to express interest in my academic pursuits there. I was fortunate to remain in con constant contact with Professor Miller, even for a few months after my moving to New York for my doctorate, as I was helping edit one of his forthcoming books, which was a pleasure to read. Here too, Professor Miller was bent on making sure I was completely aware of what the task was and how to better fulfill it. He seemed, however, more concerned about me acquiring the editing skills for the future than with the immediate results for his book. I'm especially grateful for the patience he showed at that point, as he knew I was going through a few personal problems about which he has always been kind to ask. It was truly an honor to be Professor Miller's last graduate ad advisee. I have carried with me many of the interests I explored under his tutelage, and I continue to explore them. Most recently, I have looked into the evidence for massive rabbinic gatherings in the early rabbinic period, a topic that shares close proximity to his research into the dynamics of the rabbinic movement in Roman Palestine. It is still a little early for me to settle on a dissertation topic, but I am now leaning towards researching the evolution of the hermeneutics rabbis applied to the words of previous rabbis. I will in this and the next project certainly apply the valuable lessons of careful and close reading I have learned with Professor Miller. It is of course comforting to know I will be able to count with his advice in future endeavors. And I am sorry to inform him, he won't retire from that so soon, but I promise I won't take too much time from his classical guitar playing and from his future scholarship. I should end here but not without stressing one last time how grateful I am for all of Professor Miller's contributions to my academic development and how happy I feel to be able to honor him in this setting. Thank you, Professor, and congratulations on your retirement. Many thanks, uh, Mateus. Uh, so it's, it's so wonderful to hear from uh, Stuart Miller's uh, former students and to hear of the impact that you've had and uh, the ways in which this will continue to grow and develop as the, as the field continues to grow and, and develop. And of course, I, you know, as, as we've seen, uh, this is a very warm family that uh, we have here in, in this community. Uh, we, we have uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, community members who have come to, to support you. Over the years that uh, Stewart has been at, at the University of Connecticut, he has served together with a number of uh, directors of the Center for Judaic Studies, uh, Professor Arnie Deshevsky. Uh, for, for many years, you worked closely together. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Schulson, who was a former director of the Center, who regrets that he cannot be here today. Uh, Sebastian was interim director. I'm a current director, so uh, we're all we're all grateful for.
as 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 I mentioned, right? We do have this family feeling here, and it, we would be remiss if we did not uh, include some remarks uh, from your own family, uh, who has generously shared uh, your time and your expertise with us here in the community and at the University of Connecticut over over many years. So I'm delighted to welcome your daughter uh, Aviva uh, to offer some family reflections of you. Just a nice visual to look at while I'm talking. Um, good afternoon. Many of you know me, but for those who do not, I'm Viva, I'm Stuart's eldest daughter. Although not typically one to volunteer for a public speaking moment, especially without being able to run my words by my trusty copy editor, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to represent my sisters in saluting our father at this wonderful celebration of such a momentous milestone. There have been so many inspiring talks this afternoon. I hope you will bear with me as I contribute a definitely less scholarly, but hopefully just as meaningful tribute to my dad, or up as we call him, Professor Stuart Miller. We were fortunate to grow up with two parents who instilled in us three girls how important it is to find your passion. They both truly modeled the idea, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I've reminded myself of this message many times. I used it to affirm my decision to major in the also practical discipline of art history at London University. It validated my choice to pursue that same path in graduate school. And finally, it landed me in my current role in communications at the Wadsworth Avenue Museum of Art. The other evening, I asked my now seven-year-old daughter what made her Saba different from other grandfathers. She pondered the question for just a moment before replying, well, he retired, but he still works all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this keen observation sums up in a nutshell what was, still is, and I suspect will always be with an academic for a father and now grandfather. Well, you can take the professor out of the classroom, you can't take the professor out of the man. My father's love for and devotion to history has always been infectious. I can certainly track back my fascination with old things and I'm not referring to today's honoree, to a childhood filled with exposure to the people and ways of the past. Here are some examples. While my friends would spend sick days out of school watching the best of 90s television, I hunkered down with the prime picks of PBS documentaries that my father had picked up on VHS to test out before showing me black. I still remember the thrill of seeing Larry Schiffman come on screen, wondering if one day my dad would make a day like that. <laughs> <laughs> Now rings on our Sabbath dinner, not purchased from home goods or crate and barrel, but brought home as souvenirs from archaeological excavations. To this day, the memories of our sabbatical years spent in Israel are some of the fondest. Being a step in TA, grading and proctoring exams, car trips to various academic events and symposiums, one of the most memorable being Professor Fine's Archie Pay Conference in 2017. We often tag along to UConn during school break. Though some of the specifics change over the years, the routine stayed so comfortingly consistent. Our Hona, soda machines, a coconut macaroon from the old co-op, you know, when they still sold books in. Power naps, trips to the library, chats with colleagues in the hallway, and free book day. Always arriving with just enough time to make a quick cup of coffee and check the mailbox before heading to the first class. Sometimes he would clue me in on a joke he planned to tell and I would keep my fingers crossed that the students would give him the laugh he was after. <laughs> Things came full circle last spring when my daughter Farah joined us on campus for Abba's last day in the classroom. She accompanied him to his office, helped him make that same cup of coffee, ate the lunch they had packed together, and got the tour of the library. She brought a notebook to class and made a stellar attempt to copy down each and every word in his presentation. After the third or so, she very loudly whispered to me, Ask him to go back to the beginning. I missed a lot of work. <laughs> I let her know the PowerPoint would be available on my CD. <laughs> At the end of the day, she ensured the memory would last by drawing a portrait of Saba and his desk surrounded by his book. 
The tradition of learning, reading, thinking, and asking that filled our home is now being passed down to the next generation. But it is not just the lessons of history that my father shared, but the life lessons he imparted that made him extraordinary. Abba, in the past decade, you shifted out of your period to address timely and relevant topics. You had a blast participating in the discovery of the 19th century Nicola and Chesterfield, became a resident expert on the newer groups of Jewish American author Philip Roth, and tackled digital media to reach new audiences, temporarily overcoming your strong resistance to anything with how to pay for. <laughs> During the pandemic summer, June 2020, a particularly tumultuous time, politically, socially, culturally, my father wrote two blog posts for the Times of Israel. The voices we are finally hearing, and the other voices that need to be heard, ours. A quote from the latter. In recent days, I find myself looking for the voice, not of our ancient rabbis, but of our contemporary spiritual leaders, particularly our theologians, for some wisdom and insights from our tradition that inform the turbulent last number of years of our existence in America. Voices that bravely confront the evils and hypocrisy of our society and demand that injustice be addressed. Abba, as soon as you honed in on this con concept of a hunt, a need for voices, the irony struck me. You are that voice to us. You've taught by example the importance of empathy, understanding, and responsibility. Oh, I'm gonna cry. You've shown us that history is not just a series of events, but a reflection of humanity's triumphs and struggles, and how we need to be active participants in shaping the future. Abba, on behalf of Ima, Mina, Tova, Thomas, Dudi, Cam, Sarah, Bennett, Gemma, Izzy, Sadie, Astor, and Zoe, congratulations on your retirement. I am 100% confident that while this new stage may bring with it some much deserved breath and relaxation, it will also be filled with new and exciting intellectual and personal events. I can't wait to see what comes next. Thank you so much, uh, Aviva. And I don't think Farah is here yet, but I've been told that um, we did plan this event on June 4th on her birthday. So uh, when we see Farah later, we'll all wish her a happy birthday as well. Uh, so this has been really a, a beautiful tribute uh, to, to Stuart, to your work, to your contributions to the University of Connecticut. We've learned uh, so much about, uh, about you and about your family and about um, your, your lasting legacy, which only will continue to grow. But uh, the program would not be complete if we did not give you the last word. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a, a pleasure for me to uh, invite uh, the, as I said, the bar mitzvah boy uh, who has uh, prepared a short devar. Um, and uh, is it okay if I share this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so don't close it. Okay. <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. I'll turn it over to. Just me. Just me. Not her. Ah. <laughs> so all the one. A few weeks ago. Uh, a few weeks ago, our oldest granddaughter, Farrah, who turned seven today, you just said that, asked me one of those questions if you have enough trouble answering when one is a parent, never mind the grandparents. Farrah's aunt Tova, who's here today, our youngest daughter, had given birth a few days earlier, an event that evidently continued to preoccupy Farrah. He turned to me and asked, I understand how the mom gives birth, but how does the baby become the dad's? What did he do? <laughs> <laughs> At that point, he did the wisest thing one could do in such a situation. I directed Farrah to her mom, the Viva, <laughs> insisting that she could explain matters better than I could. Farrah, however, persisted. But Saba, you are a professor, and professors know everything. <laughs> to this, I responded, 
Ashley Farrow, professors might like to know everything, but know very well that they cannot and do not. Today's symposium conveyed what it is that scholars and more immediately university professors do. That does not, however, mean that the question cannot bear further scrutiny. A few years ago, I designed the freshman year experience course that I was hoping to teach before I retired, entitled The University of the Professor and Society. The express purpose of this course, which was proved, and I hope will eventually be taught maybe by me, was to convey to students something you would think universities would take the time to explain to them before they embark upon their studies. Who precisely are these professors with whom they are studying, and what is it that they do? In essence, what is it that makes it special to be studying with them at a university at a research university? My academic journey, as you heard partially today, began when I was a curious undergraduate at NYU, who, coming off a fine Yeshiva Day school education, had no idea that I would be pursuing today's studies. Actually, I thought it was going to be a lawyer also. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, somehow I found myself taking classes on Jewish mysticism, the Bible, and studying biblical Hebrew, which I thought I already knew. Now, with attention, however, to grammatical nuance and detail. I was blessed early on with inspirational guides, Professor uh, Asher Finkel for mysticism and Jewish thought, and renowned Bible scholar Barbara Levine, whom we actually honored a few hundred years ago, who took me under his swing and confided to me that I would soon be studying with, quote, a real Talmudist. Professor Levine was referring to Lawrence Schiffer who arrived when I was a sophomore and was already on his way to becoming an authority in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Little did I know that I would be spending the remainder of the decade under Professor Shipley's guidance and would come and would become his first PhD student in honor which I take in his part. But I cherish even more that in the spirit of Bikei Abad, Asela Harab, Ukinei Abad, that I had acquired not only a mentor, but a friend. Indeed, Laura and I count uh, Larry and Marlene, among our earliest and now long-time friends at the couple. To continue, I was soon studying ancient Greek with the invaluable classical scholar and administrative Professor Bruno Trell, and taking a seminar on urbanization of the Greco-Roman events with Professor Francis Peters, a classical historian and Arabist who could speak on just about anything that pertained to the, to the origins of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It was in Professor Peter's seminar that it occurred to me that Talmudic writings could be enlisted for the study of the urbanization of Greco Roman Palestine, as the ancient rabbis had much to say about the places in and peoples among whom they lived, in essence, the larger society. The critical study of the Talmud, mostly the Babylonian Talmud, was first coming into its own as an academic discipline. But most students of West Hartford born and raised Jacob Luzner, who was then on the faculty at Brown University, were interested in the rabbis themselves and not in the world, not in not the world in which they lived or the people, Jews and non-Jews, who were their neighbors. At the time, I was studying the lesser known and neglected Palestinian Talmud, the Ushami, as it is commonly called, or most precisely the Talmud of the land of Israel, with Professor Shepard and realized that combining my historical and literary interests is precisely what I wanted to do. My choice of separate of the topic was fortuitous as it opened another door to archaeology, which provided one more window into the past. Having followed the work of the prominent archaeologists, Professor Eric and Carol Myers for years, we can only imagine how excited I was to learn in the mid-1980s that they were planning to excavate as separatists. I was even more delighted when they invited me to join the staff of the excavation and eventually agreed to have UConn join their consortium, which allowed our students to participate in the end of the course credits. And yes, Eric and Carol are long-time friends too. Who knew where all this would be leading? From separatists to research on the, on the composition and dynamics of the early rabbinic movement to the study of ancient synagogues, to, and ancient ritual purity practices, and even to matters pertaining to Jewish life in medieval and modern times. One constant I now realize has been Jewish society, 
whether it be at the ancient urban center of Cephas, the rural community at Chesterfield, Connecticut, where in 2012, then state archaeologist Nick Valentoni, who's here, I think he's still here, and I, with a team of most of UConn students, excavated the turn of the 20th century virtual bath, or even my native Newark, New Jersey, which along with Cephas and Jewish life in Roman Palestine, and now for, I am now further pursuing and writing about the more retirements. I have long wanted to write about my shared neighborhood with Philip Roth and a generation later in the years. We did the same amount of years here, the same times of our lives there, but he gets Newark's Jewry all wrong. So we can be place. Professors do not work in a vacuum. They rely on the expertise of others for matters they are not experts in and on collaborations and debates with others who share their specialization. By now, you have undoubtedly caught my drift. I have been blessed with many close colleagues who have, been also, who have also become lasting friends. But such Professor Schwartz and Fine are two more examples. Their trailblazing work continues to intersect with my own. Michael's work on the search of poetry, or Piyot, has enriched our knowledge of late antique Eric's Israel, as has Stephen's emphasis on the material and, and visual world of the Jews in the same period. It turns out that Talmudic writings, including the vast Midrashic works that were almost entirely written in the land of Israel, are just one sort for understanding the extent to which Jewish life persisted in the land of Israel before the destruction of the temple in 70 CD, the subject of a book that I am now that I am working on tentatively titled. Uh, the entire from temple to home to community. An academic also requires the support of the department of the university. The Department of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages has been my main address at UConn from the outset. I was fortunate not only because when I applied for the open position at UConn in 1982, there were few jobs in, in, area, in any area of Judaic studies, but they also because the advertised position did not seem to be a good fit. In fact, I recall that I half-heartedly responded to the job announcement, largely because it listed Yiddish, I kid you not, along with Hebrew as a requirement. Uh, the other supposed to say now exhibit A. So let's see. I think I can do it. I've said this. <laughs> and that is the end I responded. <laughs> See, it is clearly specified. You can only imagine my surprise when I was invited for an interview and appreciate how terrified I was at the thought that the appointments committee had made some huge mistake and I would be summarily dismissed once it learned that Yiddish was not one of my languages. <laughs> I still wonder whether my job took, which focused on an arcane Talmudic term, Aramaic Talmudic term somehow got misconstrued as something pertaining to you. <laughs> In any event, LCL, Literature and Focus, Literature and Focus of Languages, which is the most recent permutation name of the, of the department, represented on today's program by Sarah Johnson and Sebastian Bogenstein, and by Professor Pat, who in fact does know Yiddish, and I guess you found out as Yiddish, but we have decades, uh, has been a stimulating home with this talented and diverse faculty of many backgrounds and disciplines, perhaps more diverse than any other in the humanities at the university. This is probably the appropriate time to acknowledge the various directors of our Center for Judaic Studies, which fostered Judaic Studies on the wider campus in the community and beyond. Serving as the academic director alongside the Center's founding director, Arnie Dachevsky, who also deserves credit for pressing me and others into going along with this idea of formulating a graduate program, uh, which I'm totally grateful for, because saw the kinds of students we actually had. Um, followed by Jeffrey Schulson and interim director Sebastian Bogenstein has been a pleasure. And I owe special thanks to my friend and colleague, the president director of PAC, for indulging me these past few years, when I am sure my appeals to institutional memory must have had times in all the barriers of my anxiety. 
UConn has seen many changes over the past several decades. The creation of the Hebrew and Judaic Studies section with an LCL in 2012, and Susan Hurst and Jeremy Tyrebaum was our dean, was perhaps the most momentous turning point in Judaic Studies. The great university's part is its faculty and its students. Emma and Matthias, whom you heard from earlier, represent the best of the latter. Yoni, I remember well the excitement of joining the Yukon faculty community in 1982. Rest assured that you are joining our campus community and departments at an exciting and auspicious time, and I wish you well. Before I return to my theme, I'd like to digress for a moment. You've heard a lot about complexity and complex, and I don't think there's any reflection on me, or if I probably think so, but at any rate, um, this, uh, a couple of students here actually took a course in Palestine under the Greeks and Romans, um, and, and might also add they read Professor Chippen's uh, primary text um, in that class. Uh, it was while teaching that course that I came up with the idea that while well, everybody was talking about the various types of Judaisms and a lot of usage of the term diversity, that the real term we needed was complexity. So it does not mean the same thing. I'm talking about the messiness of ancient Judaism. And I started reading up on this, and I rushed into class one day and said, This is different, this is complexity theory. And I started explaining to the children you know what I was talking about, because I wasn't sure I was, knew I was talking about yet. But after class, I ran back to my office and sent an email to my colleague, friend, who's here today, Professor Les Lowe, who's a professor at med school. And I knew he must know something about complexity theory. And I sent this long rambling email to him explaining how this <coughs> explains everything to me. It was my whole understanding of of uh, what I was doing and what I was teaching and what I was studying and so on and so forth, and on and on and on. And I, his response was almost verbatim. This is what he said. So I know a lot about complexity theory. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but we moved uh, about this in synagogue and we uh, were. A lot of uh, dinners and so on and so forth. And I eventually got it, I think. And uh, but we blame him for, <laughs> for having this uh, influence on me. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I'm very good. Anyway, returning to my theme, for me, being a professor was never exclusively about Judaic studies, or more specifically, the Jews of the Greco Roman Palestine. I often encourage students to seek out the great experts on our faculty and to pursue work in subjects beyond their seeming interests or conflict of. I usually ended my survey course on Jewish civilization, now for who are the Jews, Jewish identity, the ages, uh, with Hillel's famous response to the presumptuous would be proselyte, who insisted that the famous sage teaching all the Torah while he, the prospective convert, stood on one foot. Hillel's insistence that the golden rule was the essence of Judaism, but that all the rest of his commentary was much more than a clever response intended to encourage other studying of the law. Hillel, who lived at the end of the first century BCE, predates most of the sages who would later come to be known as rabbis, that is, teachers of Torah. What these rabbis and future generations took from Hillel was not only the care in formulating answers, but most importantly, an appreciation for the question, however seemingly impertinent or simplistic. Answers are nice to have, but without knowing what to ask, the pursuit of knowledge becomes a far greater challenge. In closing, I return to my follow-up response to my granddaughter about the nature of being a professor. University professors have many more questions than they have answers something that humbles our fair journey and undoubtedly is reassuring to our students. We learn too that many of the questions they raise have been asked before and will continue to be asked. Our mission is to enlist others in this intellectual journey because it is a collective one that needs the participation of others, be they mentors, colleagues, or students, which is what makes our research and teaching so worthwhile, forever rewarding and hopefully enjoy it. With that, I would like to acknowledge my supportive family, my wife, Laura, and ART, A-R-T's, the acronym, 
anybody who works in Columbia studies is had to have had the challenge of figuring out what happened in law right there, right there, all the time, basically, or on every page of every commentary. Um, so artists of evil do not and I think that was Laura's way of ensuring that I will always remember the earth <laughs> I'll read that line again. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the support of family, my wife, Laura, and Art, uh, and their families, all of whom have heard much of what I've had to say today before in various forms. And now I look forward to speaking with each of each of you and thank you personally for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, we always continue to learn so much for you. For you. I want to thank everyone who joined us here today for really a, a fantastic program and a perfect way to honor uh, Stuart Miller with the scholarly symposium. I want to thank our speakers who joined us today, uh, who shared uh, their insights, their wisdom, and really wonderful tributes uh, to Professor Miller. Uh, I want to thank our program assistants, the Arlen Caffrey in the back for all of her work to uh, organize today. And uh, of course, uh, we have food. So please uh, stick around. Uh, we'd love to uh, to have all of you stay with us for a little while to schmooze. We have a reception. We have the Crown's finest uh, catering here. So thank you all for being here again. And, Mazalto Super, thank you.